All right, welcome back to the weekly walk and talk here. And we are in Peel today on the Isle of Man. And uh, it's quite interesting. I've got so much to cover today. I'm going to start with the more serious stuff, as I often do. And then we're going to get into the more jovial and crazy, weird stuff a bit later on. So we've got loads to cover. So let's start with the big one. And that's what broke yesterday. Gosh. The wind is outrageous today, so I hope this wind blocker does its job as normal because this is pretty intense up here. But we're going to be walking down to Peel Castle, so I'm going to show you Peel Castle in a few minutes for those of you hardcore who always stay to the end of the video. If you drop out early, you're not going to see the castle. But let's start with the big news then, which is what happened yesterday. If you saw my video yesterday, I was right in the middle of recording when the news broke about the British Prime Minister, Liz Truss. How many days in office was it? It can't have been long. I don't think it was longer than six weeks, five or six weeks, I think it was. And she's out. She has resigned. I'm not going to play the clips because you're probably bored of seeing it now. <laughs> I've seen it about 20 times in the last... 24 hours all these clips of her resigning and it's just funny because the day before she was saying I'm a fighter I'm not a quitter I'm a I'm tough and all this and I was watching it going your voice tone your body language none of that says tough to me I think she's gonna quit and then as I was recording yesterday that breaking news came up that she had quit now this isn't really much of a surprise because we talked about this and who actually put her into the position there so she had a very specific job to do that job has now been completed which was all the new currency creation and and this is actually interesting as well because well i think it's interesting i think you will as well people talk about inflation a lot and where it's going and we talked about the uk inflation rate and how there's this is massive problem there and i said last week that i think we're starting to peak in some areas of inflation and we'll go into a period of disinflation. What I haven't told you is the whole story there. This is a pretty typical pattern historically. We can track this dozens of times, dozens and dozens of, of times. Now, what I think will actually happen is, yes, I, I haven't changed my mind on stagflation. I still think that. I've said that for two and a half years. I still think stagflation. But I think we're going to go into this period of disinflation. But then I think you're all going to get a shock. I don't know when it will be. But I think you're going to get a big shock. And that is as we, the inflation level comes down. And it'll come down for a little while. Now, I don't think it's going to happen yet, but it will happen. And what will then happen with this inflation rate is it will explode up again. So it's basically like two towers. So we've seen the first tower now. We're living through it. And then we're going to see this second spike a little bit later on, which will be the result of all this currency creation that has just been done. Now you think about it, this will be three prime ministers in the space of three months. I mean, can you believe that? Three prime ministers in the space of three months. And people wonder why the UK economy is on its knees. And that is also four finance ministers as well. So it was Rishi Sunak, then it was Nadim Zikawi, I think his name was. Then it was uh, Kwasi Kwarteng. Then it's Jeremy Hunt right now. It's, it's absolutely insane. You know yourself, if you've ever recruited people for a certain role, that it takes people time to actually get embedded in with any role, any job. And they've, gotta, they've really got to spend a lot of time doing that work before they get competent in doing it. So what you've got is just people jumping into the position, people jumping into the position, making changes. And whenever you have loads of, of changes like this, it creates this level of instability. And this is why we're seeing the British pound weakening. And I don't think this is over yet. We're gonna, well, it's going to jump around. It's going to be staggered. But I don't think it's going to, oh, do this big recovery. Oh, we're going to get a new government, a new prime minister and all this. We're going to have this big recovery. No, we're not. This is deeper, much bigger than one or two people. And it really doesn't matter who comes in as the next prime minister or government. But let me just touch upon that. Remember I said I thought it would be Rishi Sunak, Fishy Rishi Sunak. Well, then Liz Truss beat him to it. 
Well, it's looking like he may actually be the Prime Minister after all. How funny is that? But if it's not Rishi, I would, if I was betting on it, which I don't, I would say it's either going to be Penny or you could even see a wild card, Boris Johnson come back. I don't think that's very likely. It's in all the media at the moment that Boris might come back and the odds actually with the bookies are very high for Boris coming back. I would be surprised if that, that happened, to be honest. But you never know it could happen. But let's jump over to another very serious topic there. And that is the Russia-Ukraine conflict. And the media are going crazy at the moment. And I think this is very ironic. And I'll tell you why. Because um, obviously there was the attack on the convoy, the Russian convoy that was going into Crimea. And Russia said they're going to respond to that. So they responded by destroying 30% of Ukraine's energy production. And, you know, they're, they're crying war crimes and, and all this sort of stuff. But I always think we have to apply balance to everything. So the balance is, well, they weren't actually targeting a lot of energy prior to that, that event that happened. And now that Russia have done that to Ukraine, one thing is that all of those plants, I saw this activist post and I thought it was quite funny. And they said, oh, this is a good thing because all of that uh, energy production was fossil fuel. So it needed to be destroyed anyway. And then of course there was outcry against that, of course. But what people don't think about is that this is a lot of what these agendas are. The West is destroying all of the fossil fuel based energy anyway. So I did think that was a kind of interesting point when I when I heard that. But I still think that what's going on in Ukraine at the moment is really, I mean, it's, it's absolutely terrible. It really is. And I think that it's just a massive battleground and a massive testing ground for all of these advanced weapons that NATO and the West have created. Well, they haven't been able to test all of these. It's a new battlefield now is the way I'm seeing it with everything that's going on, all this new technology, all of these new weapons. And another thing that I thought was quite hypocritical, obviously they're going to say this, but they came out and said, oh, Iran is helping Russia. They're supplying advisors to help with the drones that are that Russia's being used in this conflict. And of course, the West is saying it's a war crime. I mean, everything's a war crime on one side at the minute. But I really do think you've got to look at balance with, with all of these things. But what they're not saying is that the UK actually is also doing this. So sending military and advisors to Ukraine to help Ukraine. Obviously, they would, they're allies. But in the same way, Iran and Russia are allies. So they're obviously going to send support that way. So one is a war crime, the other is a good thing. When in actual fact, no war is a good thing. So you could really class everything on both sides as a war crime. But I really don't like the fact at the moment that what is being targeted is all the energy. And I don't think that's a coincidence again, I really don't. But I don't, I don't like that at all. And I don't like the fact that all of these Ukrainian citizens, as well as the Russian military, by the way, the troops, these young lads, they're all cannon fodder for this massive uh, battle that's going on. That's the way I'm seeing it all. And of course, all this weapons testing that's going on is going to be used to develop even worse weapons later on. That's all it is. It's now this industrial complex you know, the weapons side are now getting all of their cuts. The last two years, it was all the pharmaceutical companies getting their cuts. And if you don't understand what I'm talking about, watch my video from yesterday. It will explain all of this. But do you remember a couple of years ago when I talked about these uh, robot dogs, these drones, Boston Dynamics and all this sort of stuff? And I was saying that, you know, I think it was a DARPA prize. They were giving out prize money for the person that developed the most human-like robots and things that could, you know, do all this stuff like going into disaster zones. And I said, yeah, this million dollar prize is absolute nonsense. What they're really trying to do is they're trying to get the, you know, the most intelligent people to develop these robots, to develop this AI. And these will become the future soldiers, these robots and these dogs and all that sort of stuff. And this is what's happening now with the Oakland Police Department in California. So what they're actually doing is they've got on order 
these robots, these drones, with shotgun attachments. And they're saying that these shotgun attachments are there to protect the police force. But I just don't believe it at all. I think it's there to, because they know eventually the police force, which are human beings, are going to start saying no to a lot of the things that are going on and what are going to be going on in the near future. So all that people are doing is they're developing their own enslavement of the population through all of these robots with weapons and guns and the AI software, which is far more intelligent than human beings. We are at the beach now, by the way, you can see here, and there's so many shells on this beach. This is where people come and get oysters and stuff like that. So we knew that all of this was coming anyway, with the police force becoming more like a military now than a, a peacekeeping, you know, force that were designed to enforce the law, keep the peace. Now they're becoming more like a military unit. And you only have to look at a lot of the, the units that were deployed during the protests and riots and, and things like that. Did they look like police to you? Could you tell the difference between the police, the sheriff and the army? Because I couldn't and I know the different call signs and I couldn't tell the difference between those units, especially because they were all wearing the military grade body armor, they're in the Bushmaster vehicles. So I think this is just a sign of things to come. So we're gonna see a lot more of these issues as we get closer towards 2030. So just before we go into some of the more crazy stories of the week then, I just want to mention one thing on yesterday's video because I had to actually change it, the title, seven or eight times. Some of you might have noticed that. Why? Because YouTube just wouldn't approve that video and I couldn't find out why. I think it was because it was talking about protests and all the stuff that has been going on in New Zealand at the moment. And I think that's probably another reason why a lot of you have said, Neil, I didn't see yesterday's video. It didn't pop up for me. I didn't get a notification. Yeah, well, sometimes this happens. It's called shadow banning. And I would highly recommend to every single one of you to go back and watch yesterday's video, even if you have to watch it over the weekend or something. Definitely watch it because it will explain everything going on with this food supply. Uh, it's just ironic that the one video that I put loads of time into is the one that doesn't perform very well compared to some of the others. But it's really crucial if you want to understand the connection with the food supply and chemicals and industry and profit and everything else that's going on there. Now, let's get on to some of the more crazy stories then. And you can see here, we're at Peel Castle now. So we're gonna walk around the castle. So yet again, two activists, this is gonna keep happening as well because it gets so much attention. Through soup, a can of soup over a Vincent van Gogh or van Gogh, depending on your country, painting in the London Museum. And I can tell you that when I saw that, it did give me an emotional spike. I felt, I really annoyed straight away because I like artwork and I can appreciate art and the talent of certain people. So when I saw that instantly, I was annoyed by it. So I, I can understand why they keep doing all this nonsense because it works. It gets an emotional response out of people. But as soon as I saw the image and video of these two ladies, I wasn't surprised. It's the same people but with a different face all the time that keeps doing all of this stuff and i wanted to read out something that really summarized it for me so let me read this out in a recent survey of young people so it doesn't say what age group um, millennials generation z i'm not sure who want to stop farming so this is part of their whole thing they want to stop farming when prompted where the food will come from the response from one of the activists was so here we go why are you being so negative? We'll figure that out later. Right now, there are more pressing problems than that. And this really summarizes it. More pressing problems than food and the food supply. So they keep saying that they wanna get rid of farmers and all these young activists now are agreeing with it. But I mean, are these people stupid? Where do they think their food comes from? Do they think it just magically appears at the supermarket? Where, where do they think it's coming from? And they're mistaken as well, because they're saying that all the methane that's causing climate change is coming from farms. 
so of course all these question, lines of questioning, well what kind of farming do you want to destroy? They're like, well we need to just stop almost all of it, animals, livestock, definitely remove 100% of it, because of course they're all vegan. But then they say even the vegetables as well, we don't need as much vegetables as we're growing. What are these, are these people absolutely that stupid or crazy? They're actually, if you think about it, they're fundamental extremists. I don't think it's too extreme to even use that word. They are extremists because they want to destroy the food supply. You destroy the food supply and the famine is going to be even worse. Milli hundreds of millions of people will die. Wow, we've got some breakers behind there hitting the rocks. So what else have we got then? A couple more stories. Major UK supermarket Aldi is planning to sell bugs as food to help poor people through the winter. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. And I wouldn't be surprised at all if this is being subsidized by one of these companies that I talked about yesterday or the WEF or some of the governments. I wouldn't be surprised at all because they're trying to get people used to eating these bugs and they want to destroy the meat. A couple of other supermarket stories then. So this is the UK, this is Tesco. Couple get fined 70 pounds as a, a parking fine when they were stuck in a car park. There was some sort of incident, gridlock. They couldn't get out of the car park. So they got fined 70 pounds. And I can relate to this because I got a car parking fine for 50p. Yeah, this is how ridiculous it was, which gave me a CCJ, a county court judgment against my credit file. Now, what? How, how can that even happen? Well, I went into a car park, the machine was broken, I had money, but I couldn't put my 50p parking ticket on my car. So I tried to call up, I tried to do all this stuff, it wasn't working. So I got in my car, I drove out. I thought that was the end of it. No, I end up getting a fine for 70 pounds, which I didn't even know about because they sent it to an address from years ago. And then because I didn't pay the fine, it went to court and I didn't even know it, it had gone to court and I lost and ended up having to pay a fortune in court costs and pay off this fine. So I can relate to people getting annoyed with all this sort of crazy stuff. And I honestly think some of these car parking companies are running a big scam, I really do. Because they give out these fines, they write to the wrong address, you end up going to court, you lose in court. If you want to appeal it, it's 275 pounds. So it's really, really frustrating, a lot of this stuff. So I can uh, sympathize with this couple, this retired couple as well. Another story then, a man was left fuming after a Tesco store refused to sell him a sandwich until he downloaded the app you know where this is going, and signed up for a club card. So his name was Jonathan Rosen, he's an author. He popped into the supermarket on Tuesday night at around 11 p.m. He was on the hunt for a sandwich for his son's packed lunch, but quickly hit a hurdle. Jonathan claims an employee refused him entry into the now checkout free store. So that means you're not having cashiers. We know that we talked about this a couple of years ago, this would happen until he downloaded their app. When the flustered dad struggled to sign up at the door, he says a staff member took his phone from him and changed the option to accept club card before he could refuse. Jonathan then told the employee he didn't want a club card. He claims the employee replied, this is now store policy and what customers want. Soon, all stores will be like this. Okay, we've got to wrap this up because it is now raining and my camera is not waterproof here. So last couple of stories then, and this is a really sad one, uh, frustrating as well, because again, it's all related to the food supply. And the headline reads, cash strapped shoppers are now ditching fruit and veg for unhealthy snacks. And they did all these interviews with these people, most of them, and again, they're not even poor people as the headline says. They're, I would class a lot of them as middle-class people. And it's basically saying now that they can't afford vegetables, they can't afford fruit, they can't afford meat, dairy, eggs, all of these things. So what they're buying instead is just packaged, processed stuff with loads of preservatives and chemicals and all this sort of stuff. I would never in a million years eat any of that stuff, by the way. If it comes in a packet and it's got a, a use-by date for several months in the future, I, w I won't even touch it. It's like when you see these bread rolls and it's, they, they've got you know eight weeks use-by date. Yeah, I will never eat that sort of stuff. Grains and pastas and all that sort of thing. I'm not talking about that. Obviously that I would, I would eat that stuff, but the, the other stuff I would never touch. For those of you in Ireland then, the Irish, are having some sort of challenges at the moment with ATMs. So the government and the banking sector are frustrated because Irish people, the citizens, keep 
going to the ATMs and taking their cash out. Well done to the Irish. That's what I say. If you're Irish watching, well done to you for going every day to take your cash out the ATM. So the governments and the banking sector is frustrated because as fast as they're filling the ATMs, they're getting emptied again. Good. Make sure to keep a lot of your cash out of the bank because when they do what they've done every single cycle and they close the bank, you're not going to be able to get your money out. And look what happened in the Great Depression. The money got locked up for sometimes months, other times years. And by the time you actually got that money out, it wasn't worth what it was in the first place. Remember what they did with gold confiscation as well. 1933, where they confiscated the gold and paid a pittance for it and then revalued it after. Another banking video then in London. So London banks have now started to take measures and prepare for blackout. So they're getting these uh, energy consultants in to start putting in uh, redundancy systems for all of these blackouts, which they are saying are going to happen. And that's the thing, the banks can afford to do this sort of stuff. They can afford to get consultants in and generators and have all these backup systems. But the average people can't who are gonna have these four to 7 p.m. blackouts every day. And we just had this headline out of Europe, European gas slumps as EU leaders unite to back crisis measures, saying there is no turning back now, no matter the cost. And isn't it interesting how they say that when it's, it's not going to affect them when they say no matter the cost, it's going to affect all the, you know, the citizens, these leaders, these, you know, these elite people, they've got all their own generators and phew, well, wind tunnel there. They've got all their own uh, generators and they've got, you know, they've got all of their own energy supply. So it's not really going to affect them as much. And then lastly, then, as we finish, house builders around the world are now crying a warning sign that demand is slumping that the demand that used to be there is just not there anymore. So they're talking about a slowdown, they're talking about slowing down their building projects because the mortgage rates are just so high that a lot of the people with mortgages have just dropped out of the market. All right, well, that is it for today. Let's stand this way so you can see the boats behind. Thanks for watching, thanks for being a subscriber here. Take care, God bless, I'll see you next week.